Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Father, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Thank you for another opportunity, Lord, to study your word. We ask that you open our understanding to the Holy Scriptures, O Lord, and let the word of the Lord bring healing and deliverance. Let the word of the Lord draw us closer to you, transform us into the very image of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord that you, O oh God, may be glorified. I pray that this transformation will bring people deliverance, will bring them wholeness. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, it's been a while now since, uh, I think maybe a couple of weeks, is it? No, no, actually just one week. Uh, we went through the holidays, we're in the new year. And I, I ended up uh, teaching on faith. And we looked uh, in particular at uh, the faith of Christ, the faith of Christ. With uh, regards to this title, the faith of Christ, you really probably will uh, grasp it from the scriptures, uh, directly from the scriptures using the King James Version. If you're using the King James Version of the Bible for this particular topic, the faith of Christ, it, it, it's a lot easier. It comes across immediately that we're looking at the faith of our Lord, you know, his faith, as opposed to our faith. Now, other versions, other than King James Version, mostly talk about faith in Christ, in Christ only. Uh, so faith in Christ obviously would be, uh, you know, trusting in uh, what he's done for us, uh, becoming born again, which is true. Uh, it's in the Bible. In fact, the King James Version also talks about faith in Christ but the King James Version adds uh, the phrase, uh, faith of Christ. All right, so what is actually, uh, what was the difference? And does it really matter? Um, it does matter, and there's a difference. You know, faith in Christ is required of all, all of us. Uh, to in order to be born again, uh, what well, that's actually the starting point. What that means is that we have to believe in what Jesus Christ has done, already done for us, uh, in order to become uh, children of God. Amen. Uh, the faith of Christ uh, refers to what uh, He did and how he lived, uh, and how he, Jesus himself, trusted God. Uh, and, uh, you know, that is the faith by which God wants us to live uh, and walk the Christian walk as born-again believers. Right? When you look at it that way, understand it, you know, just follow God from that perspective, uh, you will actually find that you begin to walk in a lot more uh, victory. Uh, you have, it's, it's, it's a lot easier uh, living a Christian life, trusting that the faith of Jesus Christ will uh, do the work uh, than when you're trying to actually you know, get faith yourself uh, and depend on yourself. You know, the point of my teaching is to get us away from depending on ourselves and rather depending on the power of God. You know, there's a difference between, you know, depending on your faith to do something and depending on the faith of Jesus to do it. Praise God. I made mention of this example last week. Uh, 
that to talk about, for example, to talk about uh, a man and a woman or a woman of God as a as a powerful man of God, it's all right. Uh, but uh, when somebody talks about a man or woman whose God is powerful, that's different. You see, the the focus is on God, and that's where I want to draw your attention to. Uh, God is powerful, and you know you have a powerful God. Uh, it's it's just really a lot more majestic. It's a lot more uh, real, impactful than uh, when I come to you, a person, and focus on you as a powerful person, because you may fall short. You know, you may not. Uh, be able to do something or the other for me. But when we talk about God, God is all powerful. Amen. Uh, that's that's what this teaching focuses on. Take the the burden off of you, of your life, and uh, just, you know, put, if I even use the word burden, burden but to put the responsibility on on Jesus, and, and that's where it should be. Uh, you know the scripture in Isaiah 9, Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. Verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. See, the, the word government there, is the responsibility for our lives uh, who rules our lives and god rules our lives our life with love with power with his grace and mercy uh, the rule for your life is on the shoulders of jesus christ amen the government of our life shall be upon his shoulder when something is on somebody's shoulder that means that it is their responsibility uh, and so, yes, it's good that we have faith, but our faith should be in Christ, amen, in what he's done for us. And then we live by the faith of Christ. Praise God. All right, take the responsibility off of you and put it on Jesus Christ. Amen. So let me let me read. I know I was quoted in Isaiah nine, uh, six and seven, six and seven. Yes, though, so, yeah, Isaiah nine, six and seven. But let's read it. Let me. Uh, I couldn't find my Bible. Well, I I had to study this afternoon. Came back. I don't know where I put my stuff. Uh, so I'm using this. Tiny Bible here. Uh, it's got a bed with me. Tiny Bible with tiny prints. Isaiah 9 and verse, well, I say verse 6, right? Verse 6 and verse 7. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. So you put the responsibility squarely on Jesus Christ. This is what I'm, I want you to focus on. Take it away from you. Let it be him. Not me, but Christ. All right? Amen. And his name shall be called wonderful wonderful means miracle counselor the mighty god the everlasting father the prince of peace of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of david and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever the zeal of the Lord 
shall perform this. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Amen. The Lord sent a word, verse 8, a word unto Jacob, and it had lighted upon Israel. Well, the Lord has sent this word to you, and it has come upon you today, upon us today. And this word is this. Have the faith of Jesus. Walk by the faith of Jesus Christ. Amen. Not by your faith, but by the faith of Jesus. You have faith in Christ, meaning have faith in what Jesus has already accomplished for you. He did this before we were born. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ died on the cross. This is already done. It's already accomplished. Now, you know, a lot of people know this. They believe it. Christians, I mean. But then we, we turn around and we begin to, as, as we're walking with God, in our walk with God, when we experience challenges, we begin to believe that we have to do something to, for God to accept us. Maybe if I sow a seed, that's a big one, you know, that's a major one. If I sow, yeah, but think about that. If I sow a seed, then God will hear me. Uh, God, it'll, it'll please God make him happy with with me then he's going to give me the breakthrough uh i know i get in trouble with uh, a lot a lot of people uh by saying that but uh we have to tell the truth how many places tell me in the bible how many places did god tell in the new testament did god tell somebody that they have to give money to god before God will help them. Where, where does it say that in the Bible? I mean, in the New Testament, we're New Testament believers. It doesn't say anywhere in the New Testament. If you find it, you can, you can, you can type it. I'll see it on the screen, or you just let me know. All right, I mean, not arguing. I just want to know. I want to learn. All right, so in the New Testament, it doesn't say anywhere that we have to give money before God hears us and God helps us. He does not say that. I haven't seen it. But somehow we're made to think that we have to do something. Uh, you know, I have to work in church. I have to be a missionary. Then God will be happy with me. And maybe if I'm married and I'm looking for a child, I don't have a child if I answer the call of God, then God will give me a child, you know, or whatever, you know, this is an example that I gave. Uh, but we have a lot of that going on, and I'm teaching you that that uh, is wrong. It, it, is, it is just wrong. I don't know how else to put it. it it's wrong. Uh, should... Does that mean that we shouldn't be missionaries or do the work of God? That's not it, you know. You have to answer God's call on your life. You have to do what God wants you to do. You have to uh, give money to support the work of God. All these things are in the Bible. But God doesn't say that you have to do anything before you... Because he saves you or gives you the benefits that come along with salvation. If there are benefits that come along with salvation, that the benefits are consequent on being saved. The benefits are not consequent on doing this or doing that. You know, it's, it's, it's like uh, if you uh, have a job. And you're given a base salary, and you're told that with that position comes four weeks of vacation or six weeks of annual vacation. 
and it, which is pretty good, right? Uh, if you're in Europe, <laughs> if you're in America, they don't give you six weeks. They don't give you four weeks. Anyway, uh, and they tell you you have health care, all right? You know, and then you have this percentage that goes to your retirement, you know, benefit. You know, it's it, it's a benefit that comes with the position. So that position has a, a package, comes as a package. You get time off, uh, maybe maternity leave. Uh, they used to call even sick leave or personal time, you know. And, and uh, some companies will give you stock options. It comes it, as a package. It comes together. As long as you have, uh, you, you're employed. You get it? Last week I gave another example that uh, if you're born traditionally, if you're born in a place, if you're born in a country, you're a citizen of that country. You don't have to do anything to become a citizen of that country. You just have to be born there. That's it. Right? I mean, just, just think about this. If you're born in America, right now, according to the laws of America, and most countries, if you're born there, you are a citizen. Yes? Okay. And if the country says citizens can vote uh, at a certain age, that's your right. You don't have to do anything to earn the right to vote apart from just being a citizen. We, you have to get this. When you're born again, when you're born again, it comes with certain benefits. That's it. Just like your job, your, 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 your job, your position has this base salary and some benefits. You know, medical care comes with it. Well, when you get born again, there's medical coverage. The medical coverage is that by the stripes of Jesus, you are healed. Yes, you are. That's what the Bible says. You are healed. Amen. We are healed. The same person who saved us from sin, saved us from sickness. Keep in mind, that from our text scripture in Isaiah 9, 6, unto us a child is born. Jesus was born for us. To us a son is given. He was given to us. Amen. And to order our lives, that's his responsibility. The government for our lives is his responsibility. There's a beautiful picture of this uh, scriptural picture, biblical picture given to us in Luke 15 of a shepherd or of a person who lost his sheep. He had a hundred sheep. He lost only one. He left the 99 safe when looking for that one. When he found his sheep, he put the sheep on his shoulders, rejoicing. You know who that speaks of? That speaks of God. It speaks of Jesus. We were the lost sheep. And he found us. He came to find us through the death of Jesus. Through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And he put us on his shoulders. Hallelujah. Your life, the responsibility for your life. It's on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. I thank God for that. I don't have to struggle to do this. He's my savior. He's my healer. He's my deliverer. Lord, tonight, cause the manifestation of health in people's bodies as they hear your word. Let the benefit of healing Become the experience in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So we have seen for us a son is given. 
for us, Jesus is born to bring miracles. Amen. What you can do for yourself, he will do for you. His name is Miracle. It's not your name. It's his name. It is faith in his name. The power of his name. Not the power of Pastor Turkson. Not the power of the Archbishop. Not the power of the Bishop. You have to get away from that and focus on Jesus. Amen. He did it all. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to get baptized to be born again. Amen. You don't have to go to church to be born again. Being baptized is good. Going to church is good. But you don't have to do anything. If we add even one work to being saved, then it means that it was not necessary for Jesus to have died for our sins. But of course, we can't say that. People can't say that. They'll say, oh yeah, Jesus had to die, but you still need to do something. Well, if we add anything to his death, then we are also saying that the death of Jesus was incomplete as a full sacrifice acceptable to God for our sins. But then would be wrong. Why? Jesus Christ, he is the complete sacrifice for our sins. Amen. Let's take two scriptures to cover that. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7. All right, so help me out here. Let's do 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. And actually there, it's just it's the latter part of the verse that uh, we're looking at. All right, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. I, I'm looking for the part that says, Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. So that's that's the part that we just want to focus on. It's a little bit of a long uh, verse. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. So, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, the last part of it, last sentence, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. In the Old Testament, the Jewish people had the Passover lamb, which was a figure of what was to happen. Christ was to come. Here it says Christ is our Passover and he has been what? Sacrificed for us. So, what you have to do is you go back in your, in your mind or in your studies to the Old Testament where they sacrificed the Passover, right? And, and when you go there, let me read Exodus 12, 15. Let's just go there for those who don't know it. Exodus 12, 15. When you, when you look at it, you're going to see that uh, it, only, it took only the sacrifice of the Passover lamb to save the people. All right, they didn't have to do anything. Exodus 12. Uh, well, I'm, uh, excuse me, Exodus 12. Uh, please give me verse 13. Excuse me. It's Exodus 12, 13. If somebody can type that for us, Exodus 12, 13. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. 
and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. All right, so excuse me. The correct, thank you, thank you very much. The correct scripture is Exodus 12, 13. All right, let me, let me just read it again so that uh, we're, we're, not, we're not confused there. We're looking at the Passover, right? God says in Exodus 12, 13, And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you. When I smite the land of Egypt. Okay, great. So here's my question. What saved the Israelites uh, when they were in Egypt? You know, the night uh, before the uh, exodus from Egypt. What saved them? We all know this. If you've been a Christian for a while, or you ever went to Sunday school as a child, we know this. Uh, even if you've watched Charleston Heston, you know, the Bible on TV, you've seen this. You see, that they put the blood on the house, and they are in the house, and that night, there is this weird sound going through Egypt, and you hear wailing in the homes of the Egyptians, and their firstborn has been slain. But the Israelites are safe inside their houses in Egypt, uh, in the land of Goshen. Why? Simply because of the blood, the blood, the blood of the lamb. Amen? Okay. So I'm not going to turn to this, but I'm just going to quote it and continue. John 1 verse 29 says that Jesus is the lamb of God. John 1, 29 says, Jesus is the Lamb of God. So the Lamb that was slain is Jesus Christ. Please, please rest. Rest. After tonight, if you're going through something and the devil begins to tell you that, well, you're not good enough or you have not fasted enough, you haven't prayed enough so you won't get a miracle or you need to do this or do that, don't believe that lie. Don't believe that lie. Just say that Christ, my Passover, has been sacrificed for me. Lord, thank you. That because I'm under the blood of Jesus, I'm safe. Because me and my family, we are in the house. And the blood of Jesus is on the house. We are safe. You are safe. You are safe when you fly. You are safe when you drive. You are safe when you're in the home because the blood of Jesus has covered you. That is it. That, that's it. What you do cannot save you. God has already saved us through Jesus, but we have to accept it to apply it to us. Do you get it? You, you have to accept it to apply it to you. But if you accept it and you add something else to it, then you are not accepting it. Do you understand that? The people who are wondering, well, Lord God, what's going on? And sometimes the problem is that they are not resting in what God has done for them. They are not trusting God. They are trusting that if they pray, they have all night prayer meetings seven times a week, then the power of the all-night prayer is what will do it for them. It's nothing wrong with the all-night prayer. The all-night prayer that you're having is applying what has already been done to you or for you, applying that to you. But if you are dependent on what you can do to save you, that's what I'm saying, that it's wrong because you are negating faith in what Christ did for you. I, I just, I pray that you get it. Let me give you another scripture about, about the blood of Jesus Christ being what God chose to save us. And then, and then we'll move on. 1 Peter 1 verses 18 
and 19. In fact, maybe we'll read even 20 as well. But 1 Peter 1. I read verse 18, I read verse 19 and 20. So let me read from verse 18. 1 Peter 1, 18. For as much as you know, what do we know? What do you know? This is 1 Peter 1, 18. For as much as you know. So, again, again, in 1 Peter, 1 Peter 1, verse 18. Amen. It says, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. That's right. From your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Remember I, I was saying that sometimes we think that if we pay money, if we sow a seed of money, then God will give us a breakthrough. And I'm saying that you don't need to do that. Now, you can, you can, um, you should support God's work. Give, give tithes, offerings, gifts of love, thanksgiving offering, whatever God leads you to do. In fact, even if, even if God tells you yourself to uh, do something, all right. I make some commitment to him, uh, make a vow to him. If God is the one who tells you, it's not that when I tell you to do something, but God tells you to do it, then, uh, then you respond to God. You, you understand that, you know. Um, and that's, that's just God testing your obedience, you know. But it's not God saying that uh, the blessing will only come if you give God this, or if you make this vow, make that vow. When God tells you to make a vow, whatever it may be, that's holy and righteous and, and biblical, maybe including giving money or committing to do something, whatever. If God, it's not coming from me to you, all right, but God tells you directly, that actually is to test your obedience to him. And God will promote you uh, based on the obedience to what he said to you. Do you get that? That's different from God having committed to save you through the blood of Jesus and God having committed to giving you benefits that come along with being born again, being saved. You understand the difference? Amen. So in 1 Peter, 1 Peter 1, uh, 18, 18, just please note it. Type it for us, please, uh, somebody. 1 Peter 1, 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, so this is what I'm saying. If you, if anything that's corruptible comes in as part of your redemption, you're wrong. You should know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things. For example, it says, as silver and gold. Do you see that? So money, money cannot redeem you. Money cannot redeem. Underline that in your Bible. You know, for as much as you know. But do you know? Some people don't know. You have to know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things. Your redemption does not come from giving silver or gold to the ministry. That, that's wrong. I mean, you know, people believe this. And some people say, it. if you say something long enough, people will believe it. Even if it's not true. There are people who have that mentality. They think, you know, if you keep saying something long enough, People believe it, even if it's erroneous. Hitler believed that. <laughs> you know, if it's a lie and you just keep saying long enough, people believe it. I'm telling you that it is a lie that you have to give money 
before you are redeemed. It is a lie. It is, but it's been said so long that even now, for me saying it, I kind of feel something. You know, I feel like, oh, be careful, you know. But look, look at the Bible. The Bible says, so if we, if we believe that error, then our faith is off. Our faith is not in, in God. We are walking by some other faith instead of Jesus' faith. Because the faith of Christ trusts absolutely in God. It has no confidence in the flesh. Do, do you get that? <laughs> I, I think maybe some things aren't being getting done in our lives because we are trusting in the flesh and may not even be aware of it. We're just living some kind of faith life that is a tradition that was set up, but it's actually not biblical faith. Because, ladies and gentlemen, pure biblical faith has no confidence in the flesh. Amen. Do you get it? Ah, well, let's look at this. 1 Peter 1, 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. So, what, what tradition have you received from your spiritual fathers that are fruitless ways of living? Think about it. You know, that these people to whom he was writing had a way of living and relating to God that he said there were traditions they received from their fathers. And he's telling them that, listen, people, these things were fruitless. I pray that God will open people's eyes to catch this. You know? And that as Christians, we will really rest on what Christ has done and have faith, walk by the faith of Christ, not our denominational faith, not the type, the style of faith that our pastor has, right? But the faith of Christ. Because you notice he's saying in 1 Peter 1, let me read from the Amplified. Let's see what the Amplified version says. 1 Peter 1 verse 18. You must know and recognize that you were redeemed and ransomed from the useless, fruitless way of living inherited by tradition from your forefathers, not with corruptible things such as silver and gold. Your redemption does not come through money. God does not need your money to save you. Praise God. Amen. I, I just pray that uh, you will get it tonight and help me. I'm using, I, I couldn't find my, my Bible. I've marked up my Bible. I just came from a study and I put it somewhere. I was rushing. So I'm using a smaller Bible, a new Bible. And I, I can't, you know, but God will help me. How, you know, I'm thinking of a scripture. I think Paul said this. I'm not done with 1 Peter 1, but I'm coming right back to it. Let me look for this. I think it's Philippians 3. Is it Philippians 3? Help me, Lord. Uh, Philippians. It's got to be. It's got to be. Uh, oh, Philippians 3. Verse 10, is it 10? Let me see. Philippians 3. Uh, thank you, Lord. Okay, yes, yes, thank you, Lord. It's Philippians 3. But it, it actually starts before verse 10. Uh, Philippians 3, verse 1. Verse 1, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, it's not grievous, but to you it is safe. It's not what I want, but I read on. I think it's verse 3. 
verse verse two beware, beware of doubt dogs beware of evil workers beware of the concision okay so i don't need philippians 3 1 and 2 for this for this study but verse 3 for we are the circumcision who worship god in the spirit and rejoice in christ jesus and have no confidence in the flesh thank you jesus that's what i want so philippians 3 verse 3 please note verse 3 let's let's meditate on that i read again philippians 3 verse 3 in the king james version note verse 3 please for we are the circumcision who worship god in the spirit and rejoice in christ jesus and have no confidence in the flesh the Amplified Version says in verse 3, For we Christians, Christians, are the true circumcision who worship God in spirit and by the Spirit of God and exalt and glory and pride ourselves in Jesus Christ and put no confidence or dependence on what we are in the flesh and on outward privileges and physical advantages and external appearances wow this is powerful amen put no confidence in the flesh amen have no confidence in the flesh so what i'm teaching you about this is that you know this it's uncanny it's it's deceptive. We sometimes think that we are walking in faith, but we add dependence on something we are doing in the natural. If, if I do this, Lord, then you do that for me. And what I'm teaching you tonight is that the responsibility of your life is not on what you're doing. It's on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. Those of you who are parents, let me ask you a question. Those of you who are parents, in the care and protection of your children, do you expect your children to do anything before you protect them? Think about it. No. You defend your child no matter what. Amen. And you are human. I'm telling you, our Father will protect us. Our Father will, depend, will defend us. Amen. But sometimes we're not trusting in that. We're trusting that, oh, you defend me and protect me if I do thus and so. If I'm good enough. No. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. The same way that the blood of the lamb was sacrificed in Egypt, in the land of Goshen, by the Israelites, and they applied the blood on their houses. That was it. Amen. So if there's anything at all we are to do, it is just to apply the blood on our houses. You understand? Your house is yourself, your body. Your spirit lives inside your body, and you have a soul. This is your house. You have a house in heaven which, which God will give to you. It will replace this earthly house. Amen. So now we live in this earthly house. Your body is your earth, your earth suit in which you live and you wear. One day you put it off and you wear a heavenly suit. Amen. Oh, glory to God. Now, that's not even going to be done because you did anything good. You, you, can't, you can't do anything to get a heavenly suit. God just gives it to you because you believe in Jesus. And now catch this. The key is to live now by the faith of Jesus. You know, 
uh, it's the demon will be cast out. For example, when you call on the name of Jesus, you call on the name of Jesus. Who does the work? Jesus. Call on the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus represents the physically absent Christ. Right? Let me say it again. Physically, Jesus is absent on earth. Physically, he's not here. He is bodily seated in heaven. But his spirit is working here on earth. And he's left us his name. When you call on the name of Jesus Christ, Jesus comes to do the work. Amen. So it's not your faith that is driving out the demon. Do you understand that? It is your faith in Jesus. All right? Amen. And that faith in Jesus brings Jesus on the scene when you call on his name. Yes, you have to call. But you're calling because you believe. Do you get it? The calling is not your work. The only work you're doing as far as the calling is expressing your faith in him. You're calling on him because you said, I trust you. And we're calling because he said we should call. <laughs> you understand? He said, you, call, call, you got to call my name. Amen. When you pray to the Father, pray in Jesus' name. And when you cast out devils, call on my name and I will do it. You understand that? Amen. Uh, let, let's take an example uh, in, in Acts 3. It's a good one. I'm just letting the Holy Spirit. Oh, I didn't, I didn't finish First Peter. All right, let me just finish First Peter. Oh, Lord, thank you. Finish First Peter 1, and then I go to Acts 3. In First Peter 1, remember we read verse 18, that we should know that we are redeemed, not with corruptible things. Everything on earth, everything I'm doing, you're doing, that's corruptible. Everything about Christ is incorruptible. So let it be of Christ, not of you. Amen. So we're redeemed, 1 Peter 1, 19, with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained, verse 20, before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Thank you. So Jesus Christ was sent by God in these last days for us. For us, a child is born. For us, a son is given. And the responsibility for your redemption is on his shoulders. He will help you. Amen. Let's go to Acts 3, verse 16. Acts 3, verse 16. Powerful, powerful, powerful verse. He says, and his name through faith in his name has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which is by him has given this man this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. This is Acts 3, verse 16. Let me see what the Amplified says. Acts 3, 16. And his name, through and by faith in his name, has made this man whom you see and recognize well and strong. Yes, the faith which is through and by him, Jesus, has given the man this perfect soundness of body before all of you. Amen. Okay. Uh, those, for those who don't know this, the story here is that it's of a cripple uh, that uh, Peter and John prayed for. And I want you to notice, I'm going to show you uh, what Peter said directly to 
the cripple before the cripple got up and walked. Acts 3, verse 6. But Peter said, silver and gold, referring to money, have I none. But what I do have, that I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. All right. Now, the silver and gold that Peter said he did not have, that represents what I've been telling you tonight, that we should not put our faith in. But our faith should be in Jesus Christ. Amen. You're not redeemed through silver and gold. It's not your money that you put in the offering that made God love you more. <laughs> no, he loves you. From the foundation of this world, God chose you. Please rest. God will help you. God will bless you. God is looking for us to express faith in Jesus Christ and please get a difference and to live by the faith of Christ. Amen. All right. So twice I've shown you tonight in this study, we've seen that we're not redeemed by silver and gold. It's, it's important. It's important. You know, the, all of you out there who have been told that you have to sow money for God to help you, I'm telling you, we are wrong. We, we are just, ah, Jesus, we are wrong. What happened to Christianity? What happened to us? We are wrong. That's... That's not Christianity. I mean, where did you see Paul in the New Testament telling all these churches that he founded that they had to give money? I mean, where does he say it? Where did Peter or, or Paul, where did, where did they tell anybody they had to sow a seed? It, it's not in the Bible. It does not say that you have to sow a seed, a thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars. It is not in the Bible. It's it's not there. It's not there. It's a, you know, God is so merciful. God is so gracious. I mean, you know, people are gonna stand before are gonna be like, wow. So all that I was doing, that was not even Christianity. Lord, you didn't even require any of those things from me. You just loved me. All I had to do was rest. Just rest. He who did not spare his own son, Romans 8, but gave him up for us, shall he not together with Jesus freely give us all things? He will. He will. Tonight, the Lord bless you, my dear brothers and sisters. May the Lord help you and your families. The Lord be your comfort. The Lord be your strength. The Lord redeem you if there's pain in your body. I give you the name of Jesus. I don't give you silver or gold. I don't give you anything natural, but I give you the name of Jesus. Through faith, in the name of Jesus, not taking any of his power out by substituting it with something or adding something to his power, which in fact takes away from the faith that you should have in Jesus. But I give you the name of Jesus. May your ankle bones receive strength. May your tissues and ligaments receive strength tonight. From the crown of your head to the soles of your feet, be made whole in Jesus' name. 
Hallelujah. I drive fear out of your family, out of your home. I command the spirit of fear to leave. All manner of spirits that bind you, I command them broken, their power broken. You are loose tonight in Jesus' name. Live free. Rest. Rest. His name, through faith in his name, has given this man perfect soundness. I pray for you, my brother, my sister, through the name of Jesus, may you have perfect soundness. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We got to come back to Bible Christianity. Then we're going to see real signs and wonders. We're going to see Jesus, the miracle worker, work miracles. We're going to see the mighty God, not mighty men and women of God, but men and women of God who have a mighty God work mightily in Jesus' name. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. My heart is just stirred up that we will walk by the faith of God. Amen. Let me give you another scripture. Galatians 2.20. That directly talks about the faith of Christ, living by the faith of Christ. Galatians 2.20. If somebody can type that for us so that we know we have it and, and people can refer to it. Uh, Galatians 2.20. Praise God. All right. Thank you, Lord Jesus. It reads... I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Praise God. Jesus loved me and gave himself for me. You don't have to do anything more for God or Jesus to love you. Praise God. Remember I quoted, oh, I just quoted, we didn't turn to it. But Romans 8.32 says, If God did not spare his only begotten son, but gave him up for us, shall he not together with Christ freely give us all things? Amen. That's why Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. That's it. Let people focus on Christ, on God. So Paul says in Galatians 2.20, the life I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I want to leave you with that tonight. Paul says he lived by the faith of the Son of God. Amen. So let your faith be dependent on Jesus. Jesus, you do it. Lord, you are my mighty God. You are my prince of peace. You are my counselor. You give me the wisdom. You give me the counsel. Let it flow through me. Amen. You flow through me. Live your life through me. Do you see what Paul is saying? I live by the faith of the Son of God. Amen. The Lord bless you. Live by his faith. Amen. And may you, like Paul, begin to see mighty signs and wonders in your life. Like Peter, may you see cripples walk through faith in the name of Jesus Christ. Be blessed. Be blessed. Amen. Praise God. So let's have Romans 8.32. Romans 8.32. If you type that for us so that we know we have that too on record. Romans 8.32. And then I pray. Romans 8.32. Amen. I, I did say the previous scripture was our last one, but this is really, really our last one. Romans 8.32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? The Amplified says, he who did not withhold or spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not also with him freely and graciously give us all other things? Oh, yes. 
God will do it and has done it. May the Lord, our God, bless you exceeding abundantly above. All that you wish for, you dream about, you hope for, you pray for, you even think about. May he do it by the power of his spirit at work within us. Amen. In Jesus' name. Notice from this prayer, it's a scripture in Ephesians 3.20. God does exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. God is not blessing us dependent on what we ask for or what we think about. He does more than you expect him. He does more than you ask for. Do you, do you catch it? So there is a faith that tells you, you just go to God depending on what you're asking, what you're fasting, what you're praying, what you're reading. And there's a faith that, that is in God who does more than what I'm asking, what I'm praying. Do you catch the difference? I pray that you got it tonight. Hallelujah. The God kind of faith is God's own faith by which he spoke everything to being. Jesus' faith is the faith by which Jesus believed God to raise him from the dead. And God did it. Walk by that faith and you see God lift you up to walk on the high places of the earth. May you be blessed. May your house be blessed. I have enjoyed sharing with you tonight. And I pray that um, you have been stirred up to see God in a new light. And that you continue to study the Bible in the light of the revelation you've seen tonight. Amen. And if you continue with me uh, in the subsequent weeks, we will study some more, meditate on these things. You know, just dwell on them. And... We become grounded in these truths to be transformed into the image of our Lord and Savior Jesus. May you be blessed, you and your house, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.